Welcome to Lacrosse Recruiting 101, where the biggest names in lacrosse share their inside views and expertise. Now, your host, Luke Cometti. In this episode of the podcast, I talk with John Galloway, the head coach of the Jacksonville men's lacrosse team. And John gives us some great insight into the recruiting process at the Division I level. Also, what him and his staff at Jacksonville have learned and continue to learn as they build their program. I truly believe that players and parents involved in the recruiting process right now will get a lot of questions answered by listening to this discussion, and it will hopefully help those be better prepared moving forward. Remember, if I miss something or there's something you'd like to see on the next podcast, then please email us at questions at lacrosserecruiting101.com or tweet at our Twitter handle at laxrecruit101. Thanks for tuning in. Coach John Galloway, Jacksonville University, thanks for coming on. Thanks for making the time. Always a pleasure catching up with you, man. Hi, thank you for having me, man. I love doing this and always look forward to catching up with a former Wildcat. <laughs> so let me guess, uh, low 90s right now in Jacksonville, uh, sun shining. You may even be at Neptune Beach at the moment. <laughs> it's actually Tuesdays are our day off in the eight-hour phase, so we are we are off. We give the guys the day to catch up with classes and homework, and uh, I, I make the coaches stay at home. It's an opportunity for us to spend some time with family or our dogs or hang out at the beach before we kind of get into the grind of October fall ball. And, yeah, it's finally breaking 90, so I'm looking forward to seeing some class come through. And, uh, as always, we're excited for October weather down here. Perfect. So uh, why don't you get us, give us a little update on this past summer, kind of how it went for you. How'd you end up from a recruiting standpoint? Yeah, this summer was, you know, it was intense. It really, as the, all the coaches in the division one landscape start to adjust with the new rules and the September 1st, uh, timeline for juniors in high school. I think this summer was a, a wake up call for a lot of us. You know, we, we spent a lot of time and effort trying to invest in the 2020 class last September 1st it was it was the first time that we made that adjustment to that timeline so I think a lot of coaches and programs felt the pressure to put together a class maybe quicker than they they would have liked and I think the biggest takeaway for me leaving this summer of the recruiting circuit was there are still so many talented kids that were left off the table uh that you know that are now 2020s that are now going into their senior year uh you've seen a bunch of those get get picked off as the summer has come to an end but I think looking yeah. back, you know, we, we realize that it, it, it is certainly not a race to the finish line. It is a marathon, and we have to do a better job of, of keeping control of our, our own competitive juices and making sure that we, we evaluate everybody and, you know, take the two-year cycle to make sure that we pick the right guys that are for our program. So did you finish up your 20 class? Do you still have a few spots open, knowing that there's still some good players out there? Yeah, yeah, we still have two spots available, um, and, and I say two spots loosely. You know, we are not capped as a university, so uh, we can bring in ten more if we'd like. But obviously, with always keeping in mind the pulse of the team and and the numbers in the locker room. But uh, I, I do think we'll probably bring in two more guys. We just committed a kid four days ago, so you, you can see how this class nice. has continued to be fluid. I mean, we probably had nine or ten commitments before Christmas, and then and then really spread out the rest of the process going into this fall and and even in this winter. What is your goal for the fall? And, you know, where, where, where are you going to be as a staff as well? Yeah, I think we really changed our outlook going into this fall. So what we did on September 1st is we called probably 40 to 50 guys that we felt strongly about. And, you know, last year we probably called 150. And we felt like we could lessen our net a little bit just because we knew we felt comfortable about those guys. And then now we will re, re-engage some of those players that we talked to. We'll We'll go see some players that we're currently recruiting, but we'll also open up the doors for a, a new wave of 21s that, you know, we feel like can be impact. So, you know, I, I've, I've changed my model to being a little bit more phasic. So phase one was September 1st. That's obviously all the guys we saw this summer. And phase two will be November. But we just have to keep in mind, November, you're probably losing a lot of the football guys, a lot of the hockey guys, a lot of the basketball players. Uh, and those are the types of players that have, have thrived in our program. So, I uh, have to have to you know go to those events with a little bit of a grain of salt and make sure that you're just looking for the right fit and, and not trying to finish your class. How do you decide those events? 
do you look at where players on your radar will be? Do you let them know where you your staff will be? You know, does it help if pretty much they reach out and say, "Hey, coach, I'm going to be here this fall, or I'm going to be here in November"? Yeah. How does, how does that process work? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's it's a difficult question to answer because every every player's position on our board or every player's outlook on the recruiting cycle is, is a little different. So, uh, for the guys that we saw this summer, obviously our biggest challenge right now is collecting their schedules. Knowing, you know, the reality is a lot of those guys are football athletes, and uh, to be able to ask a kid to, to go to a tournament in Philadelphia on Saturday when they're playing a football game Friday night in Dallas, that's a really difficult request. So we do really just go out to the four or five main events, the events that we feel like we've had success in the past, and let those players know where we'll be. Uh, there's specific guys, obviously, we've offered already that we'll go watch and support. Um, but, you know, trying to make sure that we, again, keep the reins on our coaching staff a little bit to make sure we're not reaching to make decisions. And, uh, you know, knowing that the guys that we felt good about, we still feel good about. And the guys that we need to see, uh, you know, it might be luck of the draw a little bit on a weekend in November. And it also might be having the patience to wait to see them again in the summer. Yeah, and I love that you bring up that your understanding for football players, especially that aren't already in the area, right? If it's a Philly event, you know, you got guys, for example, down here in Austin, Texas, who play on Friday night. And I mean, you've even played a little football yourself. Trying to even play the next day and the following day is going to be hard enough as it is, let alone when you're halfway across the country. So when those players reach out and say, hey, coach, I can't really make these type of events, what do you tell them? Yeah, you know, that's something that we've experienced even the last couple of weeks. We actually host the a bevy of prospect days throughout the fall. And um, the other day we, we had a camp and a young man showed up and uh, showed up even though he couldn't play. He actually got a concussion the night before in football. And, you know, I sat down with him and his dad and I just explained to him, you know, the, the priority for you guys has to be your development. And it can't be what our timeline is. Uh, and I assure kids all the time, if you're a talented lacrosse player, you're going to find a home. And as I mentioned, we just committed a 2020 this week. I mean, that's a guy that was patient throughout the process, continued to stay on coaches, continued to find ways to get in front of them. And ultimately he found the right home. And I think that's what I would encourage kids and parents to specifically parents to think about is, you know, just because you didn't make that one prospect day or that one Saturday in November doesn't mean your recruiting timeline is going to, to be cut short. If you have a, a great support staff around you, especially your club coaches, your high school coaches, if you have, you know, people around you that can provide you with the guidance to talk to the certain coaches or to get the prospect days or to keep yourself, excuse me, on their radar, you're not going to lose that spot. And I think there's a, a false concept that you're going to, uh, you know, you're eventually going to run out of spots and, and not have a home. That, that very rarely is the case. And it's really only the guys that I think maybe get a little bit of lack of days of public recruiting process, specifically in the spring and summer. Yeah. And, you know, I like to tell parents and players, make sure there's a balance there, right? You want to make sure you're attending events, but you also want to make sure you're not attending too many events, right? You don't want to get burned out. You want to make sure you're still concentrating on developing, you know, especially if you're hitting these events as a junior, right? You still have maybe two years till you're going to be a freshman at whatever school you attend. So it's really kind of a balance. And I love that you say, if you're a good player, you're going to get found. Right. I mean, obviously you do need to make an effort, but you don't need to be at 20 events in one month. Exactly. Right. And I think sometimes that does a disservice to the kid. I, I think we've seen that, uh, you know, there was a young man from Canada this summer that played in one event. And I think he had 30 something offers at, at the end of it. And I think what, what <laughs> happened was he, he was, he was excitable. He was fresh. He was somebody that coaches haven't spent the entire summer watching over and over again and kind of nitpicking their game. I think when you when you go to these events, you want to have a full tank. And that's what coaches are looking for, a guy that is excited about being there, a guy that is excited to play with his teammates. And that jumps off the page to us right away, especially if it's a name that might be new to us. So uh, I would I would strongly encourage people to think about, you know, our, our job 365 days a year is to, to court coaches, to develop relationships with players, to understand the club circuit. And very rarely in the midst of that process, do you miss a guy that belongs in your program. As long as we're doing our work, which, which again is our job, uh, those players often get found. And, and I always say, if you have a good support staff around you, you'll never get missed. And, and Luke, you, you know, from our experience at high school, we had a great high school coach that 
was willing to be really transparent and honest with us. And you want to surround yourself with people that are going to be transparent and honest with you. And, and they're going to be able to put you in a position to find a home that, that doesn't just fit the coaching staff and the program, but also fits you as a player and as a student as well. Yeah, and that's, that can be very tough, though. Because as a high school coach, you know, I have, I have a good player who has some big aspirations. And he says, hey, coach, I'm looking at this school. Can I play here? And I'm kind of like, well, you could, right? If you develop, if you work hard, you know, it's like, where, when do you tell them, no, they're not quite good enough there? Because I've seen players that come out of high school that you'll be like, no way would he be able to play at Syracuse. He ends up being an All-American. Yeah, there's definitely a so message. It's, it's, just, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. And and coaches don't get it right either. You know, college coaches get it wrong all the time. I would say more often than not, the last half of guys in our recruiting class is always the more talented half. And I don't know why that is. I don't know whether it's just patience and development or just, you know, poor recruiting on our part. Um, but, yeah, there's always misses. And I think what you have to do is similar to what a counselor would do, you know, sitting down, sitting you down in your office and, having a list of reaches, having a list of maybe some safety schools. And that way you're never putting a kid in a position where he thinks that he is in a box. And, you know, you don't want to be that coach down the road where, you know, they're getting interviewed at the final four and, you know, they cite you as the guy that, you know, essentially told them they couldn't do it, you know, and, uh, and that's not our exactly. job as, as educators or coaches. So I think you have to be as honest with your feedback as possible, but also give them, you know, the, the reaches versus the safeties and, and maybe the in-betweens and, and allow them to go through the process. And uh, I hate to, you know, suggest prospect days because I don't think that that's always the right answer. But I will say the feedback I give to parents is don't let us recruit you. That's, that should not be how this process works. There's only, you know, for example, if a young man wants to be a Division one lacrosse player, it's really easy from that point to make a decision on the five to six schools that you want to pursue. You know, is it big school versus small school and, and whatever that definition may be? 10,000 plus versus 10,000 or less. Okay, is it, you know, north or south of Baltimore? And, and now your list is probably down to 20, 25 schools. It is, uh, you know, what is what are the potential three majors you might be interested in? You've probably narrowed it down now to 15 to 20 schools. And you just continue to filter out options that are really, really important to you. Can, can you fly home versus drive home? Is that something that's really important to you? And I have found, in my experience, every conversation I have with a young man when you ask them those questions, they ultimately open up their eyes and say, oh, wow, you know, I might be more interested in Rutgers than Jacksonville or, or vice versa. And as long as families and, and players are doing a little bit of due diligence on their part before they start this process, they're going to put themselves in a position to be more successful. Um, you know, and the biggest point I always provide them is you're relying on, on a coaching staff who may or may not be at the event you are at, who may or may not have a full-time member of their staff at that event. And that staff member might not be on the staff the next year. So how, how reliable is it to go to a summer recruiting tournament and maybe only be watched for 30 minutes? If you're an attackman and, and you don't have a great face-off guy, your evaluation is going to be limited. And, and you know, vice versa, yeah. if you're a defenseman and has a great face-off guy. Um, so I just think you have to take the variables out of the, the formula as much as you can. Put yourself in a position to be seen by those staff that you have an actual genuine interest in and, not much easier said than done, but it, it takes a little bit of due diligence on the family part for sure. Yeah, I think parents and players just assume, hey, I'm going to go to these events and I'm going to see who reaches out and then I'll make my decision. But that's a great point of kind of doing your homework, knowing what schools you potentially want to go to, going to those events that they'll be at, and even reaching out, sending highlight films and you know being a little more proactive. So... When it ultimately, you know, if they do end up talking to you, you know it's going to be a good fit because that's something you've set your eyes on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that um, the more research you can do on these universities, I'm shocked how many players don't know, you know, what, what majors we offer or the size of school. I mean, those are little simple questions that you can answer with a quick online search and, you know, save yourself from making trips that, you know, may cost you and your family a, a bundle of money when you can really invest your time and, in the schools that you really have a, a genuine interest for and, you know, try as much as you can to take lacrosse out of it. And, you know, that's really hard, difficult to do for 16 and 17 year old kids. But if you can do that, just like every other kid in the, in the country, you can put together a list of five or six schools and, and feel really happy about 
where you may end up and, and lacrosse can just become a bonus. Absolutely. When, when you line up your schedule, well, not even that, how do you kind of rank the following a recruiting tournament with your club team, an individual showcase and a prospect day, and maybe not even rank them, but go over like the pros and cons of each. Yeah, really good question. I think the recruiting tournaments with the club teams, well, I know a lot of folks have a disdain for the club circuit and how it's gone. It does allow some continuity for us to be able to see you play with the same group of guys against another elite group of players. So I think the summer club tournaments have become beneficial because they have become a little bit of, of what we, we were used to as kids when you have some rivalries. Uh, those rivalries just expand across state lines now into – you know, I'm excited to watch the Iron Horse guys from Texas play against the West Coast Stars or Long Island Express and see how these kids can do against players that they're going to play against in, you know, in college. And it gives you a little bit more of a realistic outlook on how they can handle that type of pressure. So uh, I, I think that those tournaments are really valuable. I know that the there's a lot of gripes about the financial side of things and, and how that looks in the summer. But selfishly for uh, a college coach, that's, that's been really beneficial. Um, the individual showcases do have value. I, I think that they're probably the least uh, ideal way to evaluate a, a young player because there is no team concept in that game. Uh, it is a lot of selfishness, and, and realistically, it has to be. If you're not selfish in those games, you probably won't get the opportunities that you want. And I know coaches all the time at those events say, hey, coaches are going to notice the guy who throws it twice and, and gets the assist or the hockey assist. And Unfortunately, those games are usually the balls guy balls in one stick, and it's a one on one matchup until it's the next one on one matchup. So, um, you know, the benefit there is you get a, a large group of different players together. Um, you, you probably can cover a little bit more ground as a coach, but ultimately the evaluation isn't as good as it is with your your club or high school team. Um, and, and then the prospect day again, in my opinion, I think it's the best. I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, just I guess disappointment with how some colleges do it versus others. Um, you know, a lot of people do think it's a money grab for us. We use it as a way to recruit. And the reason why we use it that way is because of where we're located. You know, we're not asking kids to do a visit, then do a prospect day. We'd like to try to double it up, have a kid come down to campus, spend three hours with us, go through a practice, and then also double it up as a unofficial visit. So for us, it's become a tool for us to see the players again before we make that final decision um, now, at that same time, I know there's some universities that bring 120 to 150 kids and, and host these prospect days every other week. So you have to do, again, your, your research a little bit and be diligent. And, you know, I had a parent the other day, and I thought this was a great idea. They got an email about a prospect day, and they simply said, hey, you know, this is great, but uh, can we jump on a call for five minutes and, and have a conversation about it? And it was a way for them to say, you know, let me make sure that this is real. Let me see if the coach will invest some time in this or is this just a, a blanket invite and uh, they didn't get a call back and you know for them that, that was the way they weeded out that option so um, there are ways to do a little bit of background work obviously again I go back to just having great support staff around you if you have a club or high school coach that you trust have them give the college coaches a call uh, I get those calls all the time and I think it's a great way to just be really transparent and honest and say hey you know you just sent us an email so we invited him or no, we've seen him play two or three times. We we like his video, and uh, we'd like to have him down to, to show him campus as well as obviously see him play again. So there are ways to do your homework, and you just can't go in it blind. You can't go in it with you know unrealistic expectations as well. How often are you watching video, whether it's a game tape or a highlight film? And yeah. what do you kind of use that for? Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever watched a game tape of a recruit. Um, unfortunately, just the timing, the time commitment to that is just a little bit too course, much based yeah. on the emails. Um, you know, I probably get anywhere between 30 to 50 emails. I mean, uh, during the recruiting process, especially in the summer, 30 to 50 emails a day. Um, wow. Realistically, if I watch a clip or a video clip, it's probably anywhere between 30 and, and 60 seconds. Um, and honestly, sometimes if it's a recruiting website, I'll even just skip it over. If it's a, if it's a YouTube link and I can just click it and watch, I will do that. Uh, if there's something intriguing in the email, if he is a, a multi-sport athlete or has a connection to the university or cites something about the school that actually interests him versus a, you know, we get blanket emails all the time. I, I 
you'd be shocked how many times, you know, it says Coach Corrado or from Villanova or uh, Coach Tierney. I got one the other day. I was flattered that somebody called me Coach Bill Tierney. <laughs> um, you know, but they just send out the blanket emails and forget to change yeah. the, the name. So obviously those we kind of just move on from. So I think it's being really thoughtful and trying to prevent the generic email and, and put some actual feedback in there. Do you play other sports? What is your GPA? Why in the world are you emailing me? Do you have do you have an in, intrigue to come and play lacrosse in Florida? And if you do that, I will watch the clips. I will put a little bit more time in looking into your grades and, and maybe doing some research as well. Yeah, you want to see that they put in the time to maybe mention something about Jacksonville University before you're taking the time to evaluate them. Yeah, I think it would just it would be a disservice to everybody else and, and my team. You know that the uh, the time commitment to go through these emails, you have to find a way to filter them in some capacity. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Iron Horse Lacrosse, the number one lacrosse program in Texas for travel teams, camps, and clinics. For more information on Iron Horse, visit their website at www.ironhorselax.com. Before you hit a recruiting period, whether it's the fall this or the summer, do you sit down with your assistants like Ryan Leibel and Tyler Grinelli and make sure that you're all on the same page? Or do they kind of already understand since they've coached with you long enough what we're looking for or what you're looking for? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. And it changes based on the period of the year. Um, you know, for example, we'll sit down this November and, and we'll talk a lot about guys we saw this summer and how important it is for us to see specific players and, and make final decisions. So this November is, is often a time where you want to spend two days in an event and you really want to key in on one guy or two guys. And the summer is a little bit more prospecting. It's, hey, who, who catches your eyes? And, and you know, next summer it'll be the 2022 class. You know, don't don't waste time because we have to essentially filter through a thousand kids. So does somebody catch your eye? And, and then if, it, if they do, share it with the coaching staff and then we'll invest the time to go see them. But if you try to spend you know, even just a, a day watching a full set of teams, you've probably missed the other half that you can't watch as a tournament. So how quickly can you kind of gauge some, some genuine talent or skill or athleticism on the field, write that down, not overdo it. Now that's something that we did before is just overdoing it so much, having a list of 500 kids, but not having any real notes, not having any real critique. So we've tried to really hone in on, things that are important to us at each position. I think as a coaching staff now being together for year four with Ryan and, and year three with, with Tyler, uh, they know that I like really skilled guys. You know, I'm, I'm kind of my West Tennessee roots. I like guys that can catch and throw. I don't really care how big they are. I, I want guys that have some lacrosse IQ and pedigree. Uh, Coach nice. Grinelli is a little bit the opposite. You know, he is a little bit more, I want raw size and athleticism. You know, he has a Salisbury mindset. And I think, Ryan looks for more, you know, Ryan really focuses on the D guys and, you know, D guys that have a little bit of uh, attitude, you know, a little bit of shit to them. And I think those three different types of, you know, ways of thinking allow us to, you know, be willing to open our eyes to some others. You know, if I see a six foot four guy now that maybe can't catch and throw as well, I'm, I'm more apt to put his name down because I know that intrigues Tyler. And if I look at a guy who's maybe a little bit raw on the defensive end, but, yeah, you know, he's he's just all over the field, and he's he's getting in guys' faces. I, I know that might intrigue Ryan. So uh, it is understanding your coaching staff and understanding your team and and the identity that you're looking to play with. Yeah, it seems like you guys have a good balance there. But when when you are on the sideline, what what does catch your eye? And you can be position specific with that. Yeah, I mean, I honestly I watch warmups. That's my favorite part of recruiting is watching a three on two drill and just watching how the attack move around the net and, and the decisions they make. And, you know, sometimes in a game, you know, they're, they're blessed with specific scenarios where they can take advantage of, but watching a three on two or five on four drill, you almost always know the X attackman that knows where to go with the ball. And he almost moves at a slower pace than everybody because he's examining the field versus the guys that go a million miles an hour and maybe, uh, you know, the effort might be there, but the, the willingness to read the play is there. Um, you know, especially in warmups, watching the midfielders shoot. I want to see what midfielders have the ability to shoot on the run and maybe bring the ball with a little bit of heat. And sometimes you don't see that a ton in the game, especially if the, the flow of the game isn't going their way. 
defensively, it's all about footwork. I, I just, I just watch guys drop step. I watch their hip mobility. I, I watch not even so much their stick work, but really just where their stick is. Do they know how to be disruptive uh, throughout the game? So there are specific little nuances that we look for, but the more and more you do it, I think the more and more things just catch your eye. How a long stick midi picks up a ground ball, I think is, is a unique thing that as a lacrosse coach, you kind of, you know, I had a fortune of playing with Joel White for, gosh, over a decade now. And, yeah, you know, I just know best. how, yeah, I just know how certain guys, when they pick up the ball, sometimes it's an accident, sometimes it's just a knack. And you kind of can pick that up uh, as you watch more and more games. So it is different for every position. I love skill set. I love the guys that put the ball on, on their teammates' ears. I don't care if you're five foot four. I just, I don't think that matters in our sport. And, you know, when you look at the best players right now in the, in the PLL, and I think of Will Manny and Marcus Holman and Jordan Wolf and, you know, even Matt Rambo, a guy who maybe doesn't look impressive athletically when you first look at him. Yeah. Some guys just know how to get the job done, and that's what we're looking for. Is there any anything that you see consistently that would get someone crossed off your list? Yeah, whiny plays. Uh, I mean, it's so easy to, to point the finger at somebody else in those events, especially when things are going bad. And, you know, traditionally, guys that whine, that doesn't go away. It doesn't go away quickly. There's a difference between yeah. frustration and competitiveness versus whining. And to me, that's just something that's a non-negotiable in our program, and it'll always bring us down. And we have to just avoid those cancers as much as we can. So you- you finally find find a player that really catches your eye, someone you're interested in. What is your next step? Do you highlight them and say, okay, let's watch them again? Or do you try to make contact? It might depend on how old they are. But, you know, what do you, uh, how do you reach out and how do you express that you guys are interested in them? Yeah, I mean, if it's somebody that we can communicate with at that point, you know, I, I, tr- I try to have a text message on his phone before he leaves the field. I mean, I think that, it's important that they know what game I was at, uh, what I saw on them, uh, how interested we were. If it's somebody, obviously, that we can't contact, that's, that's somebody that we want to try to. We have a rating system. Um, it's, a, it's a one through five rating system. Five is your, your you know, for us, a, a reach, an ACC guy, uh, a Big Ten player, a guy that we think is a no-brainer, would offer day of, no questions asked. Um, four are, are the guys that we're going for, four are our, top top tier players that we're recruiting and getting on campus and and, in the fight with threes are guys that we want to watch again. Twos are, we need to see again. Twos are something about it. Just didn't make sense. You know, maybe it's something that was, you know, circumstance of the game, but not quite sure if it's somebody we'll continue to pursue. And then ones are, you know, pretty confident knows guys that just might not fit, whether it's a, a guy that, lines a lot or a guy that's just from a skill standpoint and, and normally we don't rate everybody you know we, if it's not somebody that we think is is in our realm of recruiting and we won't even put a number there but the ones might be hey we all saw this guy once his name got brought up a couple of times but ultimately after watching him again this, i don't think this is a good fit for us and are you pretty transparent with that because talking to parents and players in our program seems a lot of times coaches will say, hey, we're interested, but then that's it. And they're kind of confused, like, okay, are they really interested or are they waiting to see what other recruits do? How do you interpret yeah. that statement? Yeah, I mean, if, if someone says they're interested, uh, you're at least a three on our board. You know, that, that conversation doesn't take place unless you're at least a, a three, which is a guy that we do need to see again. Um, I would say every conversation that starts with you, we're interested, that means you're a three. Uh, if you're a four, we're probably moving forward pretty quickly in the process. And if you're a five, we've probably already offered. So those threes are exactly where they are on that number scale. They're kind of a middle-of-the-road guy. Yep. The, those threes might continue to develop. They might just have had a bad day. Uh, they just aren't – they didn't do anything that, that made us highlight them. They might have been circled, but they weren't highlighted. And that's just – they're really kind of in the gray area where we're just not quite ready to make a, a move. And ultimately, we have to see again at some point. Break down a typical recruiting class. How many fives, how many fours, how many threes, and how many, if any, twos? Yeah, absolutely. I think for, you know, I'll use our 2020 class as an example. I I think we probably, you know, I've I've never been more proud of a recruiting class as an assistant coach or a head coach. I think that this is the, this is a class that we brought in that, 
you know, I, I, it's almost bad to say, but it, our measuring stick now at this point is almost, are our guys getting recruited by other schools? And, and they are. And I think that's, that's because we did a good job. You know, we recruited guys that other schools wanted and, and we recruited guys that were committed to our program and that have not left us. Um, and you know, we, we lost one in this class, which is going to happen. And I understand that frustrating, of course, but you know, want, want guys that want to be here ultimately. So uh, I would say that we probably have three fives in this class, guys that could play at the ACCs, could play at the big tens, um, would have no problem being a, a contributor early on at those programs, just as much as they will at our program. Um, I, I think ultimately they just really believed and they wanted to make a change at, at JU, and that's that's exciting for us. Um, I think the rest of them really are fours. You know, I, I wouldn't say we have any threes in that those were guys that we were unsure of. Um, you know, there may be guys that are development or, or guys that maybe add depth to specific positions, but normally you're filling the rest of your class with fours. If you're not, that means you're probably settling at the end of the class. And, I, I, you know, even, for example, the guy that we got last week, that certainly wasn't a settle. It was just a, a, a you know, reality of circumstance for him and, and ended up to kind of fall in our lap in a, in a, in a really beneficial way for us. When, when you talk to players, you know, you being such a great player yourself, West Genesee All-American, Syracuse All-American, MLL All-Star, USA Team, PLL. I mean, pretty much you name it, you've played it, you've been there. How does that help with recruiting? And I know you're a pretty humble guy. I doubt you introduce yourself as, hey, Coach Galloway, All-World Team. But how does it maybe help you relate to players? Because I know a lot of coaches do have good backgrounds in lacrosse, but maybe not quite the background you have and as recent as you have seen as you're still playing. How do you think yeah. that, that helps? You know, I, I I don't like to talk about it with guys because I like to see I like the parents to see me as you know my job is to be their kind of extended parent. So I try not to talk too much about my playing, um, but I, I do think it is uh, for us. It's a resource to explain to being pulled from a game this summer. You know that was an amazing opportunity for me to talk to not only our recruits but my team and say, guys, I, I get it. I get how you feel when I get on you or when I get pull, when I pull you from the game. You know, there's no blind, you know, emotionless feelings. I, I'm, I was there this summer. I, I've been there in those moments. And more than anything, I hope that those can just relate to the tough, adverse moments we have throughout our season. So uh, that's a, that's something I talk to recruits a lot about. I'm not – my job – and I, I've evolved as a coach in the last four years, especially after last season. I've evolved to say, you know what, my job isn't to yell and scream. My job is to – teach, to instruct, to, to provide feedback and criticism, but ultimately to make you feel empowered on game day. And that's, that's a huge shift in my vision of, of how I coach uh, in the last year or two and specifically going into this fall. You know, our guys want so badly to be successful. It doesn't mean they're going to be. And, and my job isn't to tell them that they weren't successful. They know. They have high expectations for themselves, just like I did as a player. And uh, my job now is just to make sure they know I have their back. And that's something I learned a lot about this summer and my experiences in, in all of those leagues with all those coaches is I have to build a relationship before I ever criticize. And that's something that we've spent a lot of time on. And that's something I talk to parents about a lot. Like I'm never going to yell at your son just because he's making us mad. There's, there's an investment into his, his character. There's an investment into his growth and development as a player and as a person. And that's really our ultimate job. And, and that's why that's probably where I use, my past playing experience is the most, especially in recruiting. Well, parents probably love to hear that. And kind of going off that, what do you see as the parents' role through the whole recruiting process? Because I get those questions a lot. You know, they want the player to make the initiative to kind of do the work to get recruited, but they also want to help facilitate it to make sure they're not falling behind. And, you know, they want to be able to help them out in any way they can without helping them out too much that could you know, essentially backfire, you know, how do you see a parent's role in this whole process of getting recruited? Yeah, I would say that every parent goes about it differently. And, and I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong, wrong way to do it based on your, your son or daughter. Um, I think what you ultimately have to do and understand is what are the priorities of your son? Is he looking at the academic side? Is he asking questions that he asks you when he's not with us? You know, a lot of times, a young man will come in and he'll ask three or four questions and I'll try to kind of pull some more information out and mom or dad will chime in and say, well, you know, Charlie, 
you asked me about playing as a freshman. Why don't, why don't you ask coach that? So I think parents do a good job of, of making sure that the son doesn't get enamored with the university or the equipment or the locker room. And they, they ask all the questions that they might ask in the car ride home. Um, the, the one thing that I always encourage parents to, to be thoughtful of it is to not refer to the process as we. I think that that is something that is, is really dangerous. You know, a lot of parents will say, well, we've, we've visited BU and we visited Furman and we want to come to Jacksonville. And uh, I get that you were there, but this isn't, you well, aren't not going coming. to be on campus. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and we like to commit. And I do, I get that. It is a family commitment. It is a, it is a, a welcoming uh, from all of us into the program. But if your son is going to be on the conditioning field, your son is going to be either benched or not play as a freshman. Your son's going to go through all of these adverse moments. And the more and more you say we, the more and more I think when he does get here and goes through those moments, I'm going to get a call saying, why aren't we playing? You know, and, and that's scary. That's scary for a coach. That's scary for a player because ultimately he's dependent on that other person. And when we, when he comes into our program, he is independent. He is, uh, he is becoming a man and he has to handle adverse moments on his own. And that always gives me a little bit of heebie jeebies when parents say that. And I, I always try to encourage parents to think of it as you're guiding them in their process, not in, you know, a, a collective process. And that, that helps, that helps kids feel a little bit more independent in the process as well. Yeah. I'm probably happy about their decision at the end of the day. So Absolutely. you finally found that player, that maybe number five, number four recruit who is interested in the school and he commits. What should he expect? And what should he be doing? You know, maybe as a junior or maybe two months before he gets to Jacksonville. What are things he should be focused yeah. on at that point? That's a great question because I think that's something that was starting to really slip with the early recruiting process. And, you know, I think the first thing we do is, and this is something I'm really proud of, it's just a, a program, is we've really changed the, the messaging from, okay, well, congratulations and we'll see you then, to, well, immediately you're in the family. And when you're in the family, you have to meet everybody. So we add them immediately to a group chat with their class first, and we start to get them kind of ingrained with one another. You know, I tell parents all the time, especially kids when they commit, you know, I'm getting married in, in a month, a month from today or a month from yesterday. And um, I tell them, most of the guys in my wedding, <laughs> I appreciate that. But most of the guys in my wedding are college teammates. So as soon as you commit and you meet those guys, I'm not saying they're going to be, but it's very likely at least a handful of them are going to be in your wedding. They may be a godfather to one of your children. You may be a godfather to one of theirs. Uh, your wives are going to spend time together. You're going to spend sleepless and long nights together throughout your next four plus years. So the first thing we want to do is build that camaraderie amongst the class. So that was probably the first thing that we'll do as soon as I hang up the phone with one of our commits. Uh, the next phase is, is obviously getting them ingrained with our coaching staff. So, you know, what I try to do is have each one of our coaches separately reach out to them about something specific. So it doesn't always have to be a, Hey, congrats. It, you know, it might be, you know, Hey, uh, Coach Weibel is going to run all of the official visit information and he's going to coordinate your transcripts and, and you guys are going to start to communicate. So now you're building relationships with each member of the coaching staff. Yeah. Um, and then the next piece is, is our strength and conditioning. And we can't, we can't mandate anything. We can't uh, provide guys specific guidelines, but we can allow them to know and, and be involved in what our guys do. So they're going to, they're going to get uh, workout packets. They're going to get the conditioning packets not mandated to them, but more so just to give them a glimpse into what life is going to look like once they get on campus. And I think that that's been a huge benefit for us. I wish we had that, you know, when I went to Syracuse before just that summer, you know, everybody talks about, Oh, Hey, it's a summer pack and it's coming, but how much of a real difference can you make in, in two or three months? Uh, I think the changes can be made in, in two or two years if you have a commitment and, and you start to really share your vision for what you want players to look like once they get on campus, because, I can tell you this, every single kid that is committed immediately thinks, okay, what do I got to do to play? And if you're really transparent and honest with them and say, hey, you're 155 pounds now. I don't know if I've ever had a starting defenseman below 185 pounds. So you, you may want to, you know, start happen, to think about but... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You know, and not, and not shooting their dreams down, just saying, this is really, this is what our group looks like. And if you were a serious, uh, serious thoughts about playing as a freshman, which is really difficult, 
you know, step one would be looking like a, a guy that could play as a freshman, and, and, and you have an opportunity to do that for the next couple of months. Yeah, and I, I can imagine how that was lacking with the early recruiting because not only are you maybe communicating with a, a freshman in high school who's not at that maturity level to even see to the point where he's going to be at the school, but also just the, the amount of time before he's even there. I mean, how do you keep that constant communication up for four years, you know, with relevant information? I mean, that that's probably something that was lacking, and I can see how hard that could have been. Yeah, and and I think it became really kind of a – we weren't doing a good job as coaches, you know, because you are recruiting four different classes, and then you got to focus on your team. And I thought our focus, our attention, our – our commitment to our current guys was starting to fade because we were so worried about, you know, the guys that would come four years from now. And it wasn't fair to the guys in our locker room as well as the guys that were committed. What are some typical majors amongst the players on your team? Yeah, we are primarily a business school team. You know, that was one of the first questions I asked in my interview is because, you know, as I say to kids all the time, even if you kids don't know what they want, they always say business. And, uh, I guess that that's kind of, uh, that, that'll that change throughout their careers, but to have uh, a business school that is accredited, which puts us in the top 15% of business schools in the country, it, it's got a, it's got an approval process, it's got a master's program, it has a one-year master's. We have four of our seniors that are in the one-year master's program right now, whether they accelerated their undergraduate or if they redshirted. So that program for us has been, uh, uh, you know, really our, our gold, our gold kind of, uh, stone there in recruiting. Every kid that we talk to, we can say, hey, you have all these options, but we have the business school, which is comparable to all the Patriots and all the schools that you're mentioning that are high academic institutions. And I would say right now, last year was 68%. I would say we're anywhere between 60 and 70% of our current team is in the Davis College of Business, um, which is a huge benefit. And, and then we, you know, we have 55 majors amongst the program, but engineering, education, psychology, Marine sciences, I would say probably, you know, two, three, four, five, and then sports science. You know, that's a, that's a popular one for a lot of guys that have interest in being a, a strength and conditioning coach or an athletic trainer or physical therapy. So that's become pretty popular amongst really all the sports, but as well as a few of the lacrosse athletes as well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure all those business majors translates pretty well to the field because there's so many similarities between business and sports. And that's why you see so many former student athletes who excel in the business world, right? And you probably see that right as it's coming together, how things are, you know, kind of becoming in line with what they're doing in the classroom, also how they're succeeding in the classroom, also how they're succeeding on the field. Yeah, and I, I also, I think that that translates right into the interview process for these kids. You know, one of my favorite things to do is get our guys placed in the jobs. And every time I write a letter of recommendation or a letter of reference or speak to an, uh, a potential employer, all we talk about is the responsibilities they learned on the lacrosse field, the, the moments of adversity they learned, all the things that normal students don't ever have to go through, don't even think about. So it's a huge benefit. Those kids are pre well prepared to go to, you know, the Wall Street, or they're well prepared to become an entrepreneur or work in sports management because they've been in they've been, in, you know, in, in the trenches taking grenades before, and they know how to respond versus that being their first time of having adversity after they leave college. Yeah. Well, John, I mean, this whole time you've been giving great advice, great, um, great pieces about your school, great pieces on the recruiting process. Uh, and I have one final question for you and feel free to go any way you want with it. But if every one of your future players for the Jacksonville men's lacrosse program was listening to this podcast right now, what would you tell them? That's a great question. Yeah, I think we spend a lot of time talking about culture. We spend a lot of time talking about what we want Jacksonville across to be. And uh, a question that I always pose to our team on the first day of fall ball is, what do you want your opponent to say about you? And I think a lot of times players don't ever think about that. They always are consumed with what's going on in their locker room, with their coaches, with their parents. But I want our guys to think about what's the impression that you're going to leave on your opponent. And, and that might be the impression you leave on a, a company you're competing with after graduation or uh, a student that you're competing with in the classroom. I want our opponents, our op opposing coaches, our opposing parents to walk off the field, A, relieved that they don't have to play us any longer, and B, 
feeling a sense of relentlessness amongst our program. And, and that doesn't have to be talented. Uh, I want every team we play, win or lose, to walk off the field saying, you know, I don't know what the scoreboard was, but the, the attitude, the mentality, the effort, the relentlessness that those guys played with for 60 minutes is something that they should be really proud of. And I think if we do that every game, we are going to have success as a program and ultimately going to have success as people after graduation. And if our guys can really wrap their heads around that challenge, that that question, and, and answer that every day when we're at practice or in a meeting room, ultimately we're going to become a better team. And I, I think that's something we, we can all rally around. That's awesome. Great way to end it, John. Once again, thank you for taking the time to come on here. Best of luck with the rest of the fall here and going into the 2020 season. I appreciate it, Luke. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for listening to Lacrosse Recruiting 101. Catch us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Have a question for Luke? Email them to questions at lacrosserecruiting101.com.